Welcome everyone, I'm Dave Goldman. Thanks for joining us for our special here on KTVA, The State of the Economy. No doubt the COVID-19 pandemic is a health crisis first, but now there is cause for concern financially for so many Alaskans, and the numbers prove it. The three-year economic outlook has been released. The pandemic is a factor. Alaskans' confidence in the economy has been shaken. The Anchorage Economic Development Corporation has released statistics. There was hope at the end of 2019, but it was quickly erased by the coronavirus. Not only did COVID-19 wipe out any optimism, it sent the levels back in some cases to the 2017 recession. It's been a bumpy job market as well, with openings found in retail, health, and IT. Meantime, business owners say a ballot measure in the upcoming election will play a major role in the economy. Alaska's voters will decide whether or not to change Alaska's oil tax structure. You will vote on what's called the Fair Share Act, ballot measure one, and the upcoming vote is raising some big questions. Will oil companies invest less in Alaska if the ballot measure passes, or will you see smaller and smaller checks and a much weaker economy if the ballot fails? Joe Vigil has both sides. Oil driller Mark Fairbanks was in the middle of a big home renovation when we last talked to him in 2017. Certainly not the best time to be laid off from his full-time oil job. It's a shock. You just wonder what you're, what you're going to do with your life. That renovation has since been finished, and Fairbanks got his full-time job back. Yeah, it was a great day. But relief still comes with worry. The coronavirus decimated oil demand and prices. I'm currently going back up to the slope to work back in the field, and when I come back into Prudhoe Bay to fly out, I see 10 oil rigs stacked out, doing nothing. And it's, it's, I've never seen it like that in Prudhoe Bay. And it's oil workers like Fairbanks who are now caught in the middle of the new oil tax structure debate. Our PFDs have been cut to a third. Uh, our university has been gutted. Uh, support for school bonds has been eliminated. Most of this is because we're not getting a fair share now for oil anymore. We are just competitive right now. The monkey with these taxes is to really put the long-term future at our state, of our state at risk. Well, this is what you are voting on as part of Ballot Measure 1. The group that got it on the ballot says it impacts only the established oil fields of Alpine, Kaparik, and Prudhoe Bay. It bumps the gross minimum production tax to 10% with 1% increases up to 15% when oil passes $50 per barrel. The vote yes on the Fair Share Act group expects the measure to bring in a billion dollars or more a year to pay for government services, capital projects, and to help fund your dividend check, among other things. When you bring in a billion dollars into our economic system, it's gonna have a five to one or six to one multiplier effect. The measure also eliminates oil tax credits for companies and requires oil producers make tax returns and supporting information public. These companies are up here killing a fat hog on our oil out of our fields, hiding the information we need to negotiate fair deals with it, and spending tens of millions of dollars with manipulating public opinion, trying to convince Alaskans for the second time in five years that we're going to be better off if we take less for our oil. Robin Brenna says our current oil tax structure, SB 21, which replaced ACES, simply gives too much away. The only way that we have a permanent fund today, the only reason we have PFDs today, is because Alaskans have gotten their fair share in the past. So you've heard from one side of the debate, the yeses. Now it's no on one. In November, Alaskans will vote on a new oil tax structure, Ballot Measure 1. No on one supporters think the Fair Share Act could impact more than just the bigger oil fields. They say it's complex. And, unlike a measure that would go through the legislature, there are no public hearings to explain things and no opportunity for the public to comment. Instead, we're left with a take-it-or-leave-it proposition that could be a disaster for our state in the way that it has uh, been designed with this massive tax increase, right at a moment in time when our state is desperate to maintain its oil industry as part of the foundation of an economy that's under significant threat from COVID-19. 
The No Group says state revenue issues aren't due to SB 21. They say it's because of lower oil prices and that SB 21 is working. And our tax rate. Conoco Phillips's Scott Jepson talked about investment plans on the North Slope during a recent Zoom media briefing with other supporters. When you take a look at the uh, plans that have been talked about for Prudhoe, Kapar, and uh, Alpine, there's about $10 billion on a gross basis of new investment that's planned for these fields. It's going to add hundreds of thousands of barrels a day of new production and uh, generate, obviously, thousands of jobs in support of that, support thousands of jobs. Now, Jepson made it clear ConocoPhillips will not leave the state if the Fair Share Act passes but appeared to be sending a very clear message of what might happen to local oil investment if the Fair Share Act goes through. And we'll uh, invest where it makes the best returns for us. And if Alaska doesn't make sense, which it won't under this, uh, under this tax initiative, you can expect we'll be sending our money to other places. And uh, it's going to be significant. Still got some work to do, but... Uh, that brings us um, back to Mark Fairbanks, off, one of many in the middle of the ongoing tax debate. He managed to survive one layoff and doesn't want to see it happen again to him or anyone else. Now, both Exxon and Hill Corp are also part of the One Alaska group, and they said they would let the group speak for them. Now, it's obvious there is and will continue to be much debate about what's fair when it comes to how much oil companies should pay. And we asked longtime oil industry expert Larry Persily to add to this conversation. And we asked him this, what is the sweet spot? the dollar amount oil producers should pay that satisfies a majority of people. There's not a sweet spot that anybody can answer. Put a, the, the sweet spot is when the companies make enough money to keep investing so you have more oil for 10, 20, 30 years, but that sweet spot is not such a high tax rate that they stop investing. Where that is, is impossible. The oil industry knows they will always be the deepest pocket in Alaska. What they're growing weary of and what scares them when they make investment decisions is that they are the only pocket in Alaska. Once again, oil front and center in the state of Alaska. Just ahead, canceled for the first time since World War II. Welcome back, everyone. This time of year, Alaskans would be getting ready for an Alaskan staple, but not this year. Giant cabbage competitions, rides, cotton candy, and one really big pumpkin. But for the first time since 1942, due to World War II, the Alaska State Fair has been canceled. KTVA's Heather Hinsey tells us how merchants are now adapting. The carnival midways that are usually crammed with fairgoers will stay relatively empty this year. But even though the full-fledged fair won't be happening, there are still plenty of opportunities to have a small piece of the fun. We thought we could be successful and safe in breaking off smaller pieces of the fair, making it more manageable with a smaller attendance and limiting attendance. Throughout the summer, the fairgrounds has hosted the food truck fair twice a week. Alaska's lemon earthquake shakeup usually relies on busy summer weekends at markets and festivals. We love our customers. We love uh, making fresh lemonades and make people happy. But owners say it's been a struggle with many of those canceled this year. And we really have just been needing to get a little more creative, um, setting up in a lot of different places around town, uh, coffee shops, the food truck fair is a great thing that the fairgrounds is putting on. That's really helping out a lot. Um, and then whatever festivals are happening, there's very, very few, but we're doing the best we can. The Alaska State Fair usually has nearly 300,000 visitors who spend an estimated $14 million. Vendors who count on that large influx of revenue are out of luck this year, but there are ways some of them are getting by. At the end of July, the Alaska Vintage Home Market changed locations from the tight quarters in Raven Hall to the open air barn. That gave more than 100 vendors a chance to spread out, which made it a little safer for shoppers. We are here to create a place for creative Alaskans. The market is sponsored by the Alaska Chicks Clothing Company, which usually has four large booths at the fair. 
Alaska Chicks has been around for a little bit and we are open two separate stores. We have a new Eagle River store opening and a Wasilla store. So that's going to balance out uh, missing the fair, but we sure will miss meeting everybody. This was going to be the second year Christelle Mozalewski and her Cozy Mosey shop were at the state fair. We do a little bit of everything. Started off as a coloring book. We have original art, watercolors, clothing. Christelle is a full-time art teacher who started the business with her husband. They were thrilled when they snagged a spot at the fair last year. This year, they've had to scale back. Being in the fair, we invested in a barn space. It's like our little studio, tons of product, clothing. So this year, we only had two markets, and so we, we definitely scaled back. Tundra Comics has had a booth at the fair for about 25 years, bringing the silly cartoon strips to Alaskans. Without that revenue, artist Chad Carpenter says he's had to take drastic measures. I've had to sell two of my children. Uh, which is not a bad thing, really. If you met him, you'd know what I mean. The comic creator is kidding, of course, but he has made changes to help him get through the slow summer season. It's, you know, adapt or die, and so we've been really concentrating on our um, our website. That's been, go that's been going better than ever for obvious reasons. And so, uh, so we've just learned to really start focusing on getting Tundra out in a digital format whether it's Kindle books or the movies are on Amazon Prime or anything, we've just been trying to adapt to the current circumstances. There are other elements of the fair that will be split up over the next month. The Golden Wheels Amusement Company will host a three-week hometown jamboree with carnival rides, games, and food trucks. Then over Labor Day weekend, the Alaska State Fair is putting on a Harvest Festival. So Harvest Fest is an homage to our original first ever Matanuska Valley Fair. We'll have the giant cabbage way off, the giant pumpkin way off, as well as a large vegetable exhibit. And we will also have the Junior Market Livestock Auction where money is raised for youth agricultural programs. It's all an effort to give people a little taste of the fair fun they love while helping small businesses get by until 2021. Heather Hinsey, KTVA 11 News. The Hometown Jamboree goes the next three weeks, Wednesday through Sunday, Harvest Fest, Labor Day weekend, and tickets required for both as they try and keep those numbers lower. Just ahead, the Alaska Sea Life Center tries to keep its head above water. All, and we mean all Alaskans, are doing their part to keep those doors open. Welcome back everyone. It is one of the most beloved attractions throughout the state, the Alaska Sea Life Center, but now it is in trouble. The COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a major blow to it. Fewer tickets, fewer tourists, and fewer dollars. So it's in the midst of a major fundraising campaign. KTVA's John Thane tells us how the Sea Life Center has put the call out to Alaskans, hoping that they'll come help save the center and the animals that live there. Alaska has incredible wildlife, but it's not easy to get to. Here they can see them up close and see their personality, see just how fascinating they are, and really make that connection to them. Fish, birds, sea mammals. Good boy. Wow, mommy, look. The Alaska Sea Life Center has been bringing up close encounters to visitors in Seward for 22 years, and they're worried that 2020 could be their last. Our electric bill is about $2,000 a day, and most of that is pumping water. So keeping the animals healthy requires the water being pumped, and whether there's people coming or not, it's $2,000 a day. Even before Seward had its first coronavirus case, the Sea Life Center knew they might be in trouble. They shut their doors to the public in March and reopened on Memorial Day weekend to a different world. Cruise ships have all canceled, campgrounds are nearly bare, and the Sea Life Center's ticket counter is down to a trickle. The numbers are not looking good. Our visitor revenues are about $4 million, which is a little over half of our annual budget. Um, and so when you say 25% of 4 million, that's you're getting a million dollars instead of four. So it's a very big financial impact to us. The gap in finances has forced some difficult conversations. We either raise this money or we decide we just have to send these animals elsewhere. 
because the cost of just maintaining the animals over the winter is so huge that it doesn't make sense to do unless we're going to be able to continue. As a nonprofit, the Sea Life Center has done fundraising before, but not at the scale and speed. They're looking to bring in $2 million before the end of September. Luckily, they have an artist in house. Mara is one of three adult sea lions that live in the center. But she's the only one who likes to paint. There you go. Nice job, Mara. This is something that the trainers have, have worked on with Mara to just another mental stimulation behavior, but also she paints magnets and, and different canvases that help us raise money. These magnets will sell for $12. And with a $2 million gap, Mara can't do this alone. After all, she isn't just an artist. She's also a mom to a one-month-old female pup named Mist. She's super curious, she's very engaged. Um, she, she really enjoys interacting quite a bit with the staff. So um, it's all really promising signs that she's just gonna be a really fun animal to work with and learn from. Luckily, Miss Future in Alaska is already looking better. But Alaskans are responding. And so we have seen, we can't even put a number on it right now, but we know our memberships have doubled at least over the past week. Um, and we have a number of corporations that are coming to us with some matching challenges. The Alaska Sea Life Center has always leaned on support from Alaskans. This year, without tourists, its survival depends on it. John Thane, KTVA 11 News. The Alaska Sea Life Center also takes part in oil spill response. Part of that mission, helping animals in the midst of that oil, the money coming from the settlement from the Exxon Valdez spill. Just ahead, how Alaskans are taking advantage of more space this year and shorter lines. That story coming up. So merchants this year have taken a major league hit. The tourists are not here and they have to find a way to keep busy and keep that bottom line from bottoming out. KTVA's Heather Hintze takes us on an expedition to find out just how they're doing it. At 13.2 million acres, Wrangell St. Elias is the largest national park in the United States, but it's also one of the least visited. That means there's plenty of room out here for social distancing, especially on the Root Glacier. A pair of crampons and a sense of adventure are all you need to spend a day with the St. Elias Alpine Guides. We all feeling like we want to go check out that valley down there. It's a nice casual descent in and out of it. David Wiley and Merritt Poling carefully lead a group of Anchorage visitors around the ice. For Tori McCarty and her son Garen, it's their first time ever standing on a glacier. It's excellent, it's beautiful, and nothing like getting out in our backyard and enjoying Alaska. The company usually sees a high volume of lower 48 and European travelers. This year, it seems almost all of their clients are from Alaska. It's just a really neat area to explore. The impression I've gotten is that a lot of people have heard of McCarthy, but they maybe haven't quite made it all the way out here. The road can be a little daunting, but you know, in Alaska terms, it's not that far away, actually. Merritt says they're fortunate to be operating this season. Some of the other guiding companies in town are closed due to the pandemic. They want to show off the majesty of the Root Glacier while keeping people safe. We'd like to try and do our best to maintain distance on the trails and out on the ice. Uh, there's lots of hand sanitizer being used, all kinds of measures like that. This area offers a unique pairing of nature and history. A few miles from the ice, you'll find the iconic towering remains of the Kennecott Mine. In its heyday from 1911 to 1938, this bustling mill produced more than $200 million of copper ore, worth more than $2.5 billion today. Now the area offers a look back in time at what life was like at a remote mining operation. Guests who stay at the Kennecott Glacier Lodge get to wake up to glacier views right down the road from the mine. Um, I think we're very lucky to be able to operate here. It's just such a special place. The beauty of this area, the history of this area. People come from all over the world to experience Kennecott and Wrangell St. Elias National Park. and. We love being able to share this area with them. The lodge opened a couple weeks later this year and has made changes to deal with the pandemic. Staff are only booking about half of the rooms and have switched to plated dinners or meals to go instead of family-style service. 
General Manager Christina Kirkwood hopes Alaskans will take advantage of the slower season. I know for many places, including a lodge like ours, sometimes it can be hard for Alaskans to get last minute reservations. And this summer we have rooms available almost every day. So it's a great time to explore the state. Wrangell St. Elias National Park had about 75,000 visitors last year. This year, business owners expect to see just a fraction of that. But a drizzly Saturday morning still brought out dozens of people. Some opt for low-key excursions like a tour through town, while others are all about exploring the backcountry. So we brought down all the equipment to go ice climbing. We're going to rent kayaks tomorrow. Um, we we'll go up the glacial stream. Just somewhere we've never been in Alaska. I've uh, been in a lot of other places, um, but we always heard like the Kennecott Mile was cool. I uh, got good recognition for the potato in McCarthy. The potato is a food truck turned dine-in restaurant and one of the few eateries in McCarthy. So the potato is known for hand cut curly fries. So we are literally back there hand cranking French fries. So our menu is kind of designed around that and you can put anything over fries. This summer, the potato is going back to its food truck roots with a smaller menu and outdoor seating only. We encourage everyone to wear masks while standing up um, and walking up to the counter and ordering. Co-owner Rebecca Bard says she's taking precautions to protect her staff and customers. We sanitize after every um, meal. Every time somebody's done um, out here, we sanitize as well, and as well as the pickup window. Throughout town, there's no shortage of hand sanitizer. Rebecca says many people in McCarthy are taking the virus seriously and hope visitors do what they can to keep the town safe. It's a really tiny community. We do not have any medical infrastructure. So if there was to anything to happen, like a, you know, a mini outbreak, we all have to drive um, to uh, Copper Center and or Valdez. The potato is operating with just half its staff members, and Rebecca estimates they only have about a quarter of the customers they usually see in June. Still, she's thankful to be open. It's a lot more overhead to be out here and have businesses, so a lot of people just cut their losses. Just a few miles outside of town, Current Ridge owner Andy Scheidner is also grateful to have to put up his no vacancy sign, especially when the season was looking bleak. A panic mode set in when all the cancellations started rolling in. And you're thinking to yourself, there's not a soul coming here. His six solar powered log cabin rentals are perfect for people wanting their own space during the pandemic has great southern exposure and big views. Andy changed his marketing strategy this year, only targeting Alaskans. He says, while it's nice to appreciate the slower pace of the summer, that comes at a price. You know, I was out on the glacier the other day with some friends, and it's just us. And that's a rarity anymore. So you kind of have to be careful what you ask for. We want to be successful in our business. But that means there's people here, and uh, you don't get it all to yourself anymore. But with miles of ice to explore, it's not hard to find a moment of silence to yourself. It's amazing. I want to do it again. Definitely bring the rest of the family out here. It's just never thought I'd be doing this out walking on a glacier, but it's very cool. The guides say even if you've been here before, it's worth another trip. There's always just a little bit more to see. More to see and discover on an Alaska staycation to Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Heather Hinsey, KTVA 11 News. Keep in mind, personal vehicles not allowed in McCarthy. You'll have to park on the other side of that footbridge, and they can give rides back and forth for five bucks each way. And as always, please wear your masks. That's going to do it for this very important special, the state of the economy during this COVID-19 crisis. For the entire KTVA crew, I'm Dave Goldman. Stay safe, stay healthy. And thanks for joining us. Good night, everyone.